He's lived in the U.S. for over 40 years. He's experienced the good and the bad of this country. But he's never seen anything like this, you know. Washington, D.C., under lockdown and guarded like in a war zone. And most surprising, the Capitol Hill, where presidents are normally inaugurated, closed and he could not access it. Yes, I'm talking about Ken Agua, a Kenyan with many skills, from producing branding and promotional materials to photography and videography. And you'll be surprised his background is accounting. Through his eyes, we'll understand how America has changed and how he's navigating through challenges like COVID-19. Remember, Michael Simanji is on standby in Nairobi with the Kenya to the World segment. And on My Magical Kenya, the Desert Museum in Marsabit. It's been a long journey for Ken Agua. The self-made Kenyan entrepreneur has been running a digital photo imaging shop in this mall in Maryland for 24 years. Ken's photo imaging. Yeah, yeah that's uh, when I was trying to come up with a name, that's what Ken... As we walk to his shop, the mood in the U.S. is not that good. The inauguration of Joe Biden as the 46th president of the U.S. has not attracted much business for the likes of Agua, unlike the past inaugurations. Reason? The capital is under lockdown. Tension is high. Ken would be printing lots of inauguration merchandise now, but that is not the case. However, he continues with his normal business as clients trickle in. At least his shop is located away from the capital where everything has come to a standstill. We do digital imaging, conversion of analog into digital. We brand a lot of pol political stuff like you can see probably in the background. During the presidential campaigns, Ken says there was good business. It was busy, but the busiest we've ever had was the Obama one. Everybody was doing Obama something. Who is your typical client? My clients is everybody. We have businesses coming here, we have churches coming here, we have individuals coming here, we have so many different groups, family groups. We also have some government uh, agencies that come to us for stuff. Ken's business was not spared the impact of the COVID-19 crisis. We were worried about uh, COVID uh, interrupting our business. For three months we were closed from March to July. And then when we opened, we picked right up. The business has thrived in both the analog and digital ages. Most people thought that going digital was going to take us out of business. But to the contrary, we blow pictures up. We do enlargements. You can take a picture on the phone, but you cannot enlarge it. You cannot print it. Your connection with Kenya, as far as the business is concerned? Very strong. The connection with Kenya is very strong, and actually we have a store in Kisumu, Ogingodinga Street, uh, Alimran Plaza. Every time I go to Kisumu and I go to anybody's house, that I can see our work on their wall. We do drone photography in Kisumu right now. We've been uh, hired to cover rallies. We've been hired to cover events. In the U.S., Ken has interacted with the high and mighty from all corners of the world. The biggest Kenyan personality I've covered was Daniel Arap Moi. And Moi came here, his last trip to the U.S., um, I was the official photographer. The car that I was riding on the whole day, it was me and Ruto and uh, Chris Okemo. Mikey Baki actually came, uh, came to the store that we had here when he was campaigning for Rainbow. They came with Raila, they came with Kalonzo Mushoka. Mata Karu has been here, Mukisa Kutui. Ken has been living here since 1978 that is a cool 42 years. When I came as a student, I didn't have a car, but then I had to work to pay my tuition. Affording uh, to live meant working two or three jobs. That is how I was introduced to America. If you plan to come here, please know where you're going to get your finances. I studied accounting and I made it in accounting 
and I even got certified as a CPA. I worked as a CPA for 10 years, but I lost the drive the to passion. the passion. I lost the passion for, for accounting, but I had a passion for photography. And that's how Ken said bye-bye to employment in 1996. Before I started my business, my challenge was just making ends meet. And there is some advice for those who are yearning for the American dream. In America, you have to be very focused. And if you don't pay rent, so there's nobody that you're going to plead with and tell them, I can't, you know, give me one moment. And you need to save your money. Ken gifted us with this. There's one also cooking here. Can you see this? Yes, some Champs Media branded items printed here. And remember, this was on the eve of the inauguration of Joe Biden as the 46th president of the U.S. Later in the day, Ken drove us around Washington, D.C., ahead of the inauguration. And man, lockdown, heavy police presence. Great. Ken Agua's story continues. In the meantime, let us join Michael Zimanji for the Kenya to the World segment. When talking of the export business, the assumption is that only large manufacturing companies are involved. But in Naivasha, Nakuru County, one company is working tirelessly to change this narrative. Despite their small size, Kanga Delic has been exporting Kenyan-made products for close to five years now. Our flagship product is a reversible bucket hat. We also have reversible aprons, uh, home decor, oven gloves, pot holders, table mats, clothing, polo shirts, pants, um, shorts, yeah, just a whole variety of, of items. We export to West Point, Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia, and then South Korea. We were sending, um, we got an order for Christmas. Since we've just been selling to like small gift shops and niche markets abroad, we just ship with DHL. So under ITC She Trades, which is a merger of the UN and the World Trade Organization, they got us an e-commerce account with DHL. So all we have to do is key in the information, print out the commercial invoice and everything, transport documents and the way bill, they pick and they ship and we don't have to deal with customs or anything and it's really affordable for our clients. It's totally free to join, you sign up, they have um, courses, they have the SME Trade Academies and they really help you, they sponsor you to trade fairs, they sponsored Kangadelic to Liverpool in 2018 to She Trades Global, all expenses paid. Washo, who got her training in fashion design from the prestigious Polymoda Fashion School in Italy, adds that government support has been vital in helping small businesses like Kanga Delic conquer the global market. We've gone abroad um, for several trade fairs with uh, Keproba, which was formerly EPC. So they took us to New York, we've been to um, Las Vegas sourcing at Magic. And yeah, we get people who are interested in our goods. It's just we need to get the correct, good quality and finish. And there are people out there who will definitely buy. Speaking of quality, how does Kanga Delic ensure that their products are ready to compete in the international market? I outsource my production. There's someone I've been working with for like about 20 years. They do the patterns, so we'll work together on the samples. Then if there's anything that they need to change, then we work closely together on call or on WhatsApp. And um, we post them on social media and people make orders. Since incorporation, the fashion brand has seen a lot of success over the years. Success that they say has more significance than simply making a profit. Kangadelic symbolizes the color and vibrancy of Kenyan coastal culture and lifestyle through contemporary clothing and accessories. We have a passion for fashion and a love for the environment. Our packaging is reusable. We use a Kanga bag, so it's cloth and it's washable. And um, yeah, we have um, two collection centers for recyclables. That's part of our CSR, so just to show that there is wealth in waste. 
Kangadelic's story is a testament to what one can achieve through determination, hard work and proper networking. They are proof that you don't have to be one of the big boys to succeed in the export business. And that's Kenya to the world. My name is Michael Zimanji. Great. That segment with Michael Zimanji leads us into a short break. When we return... Now they blocked us. This is what's happening. This is what would have taken us to D.C. We will continue with Ken Agua's 40-year experience in the U.S. and why this year's transition was totally different. Welcome back. Remember today we are coming to you right from Washington, D.C. We are featuring Ken Agua, a Kenyan who has lived here for over 40 years. He's seen it all, the bad and the good of America. And our appointment with him coincided with the inauguration of Joe Biden as the 46th president of the United States of America. So when I left Kenya, Kenya had just passed. Mm -hmm. He hadn't been buried. So I basically never saw more presidency. In the past inaugurations, how would this road be now? How would be the mood? Oh, the mood in the country would be, you'd be seeing high schools, you'd be seeing colleges, you'd be seeing different groups heading to Washington, D.C. The Obama's one was historic. When Trump came, things weren't so... His inauguration, the, you know, it wasn't as big, but this one is different. This one, there's nobody that's going to the inauguration. And, and coupled with the corona crisis also. Yeah, with the corona crisis and then what what is actually blocked most people from going is what happened on the 6th of January. Uh, we've never had anything happen the like chaos. that. The chaos. Mm -hmm. When I came to this country, there's so many things that you couldn't do as a black person. There's so many positions you could not apply for. There are so many positions in sport that you could not even imagine. You could not do golf. You could not be a basketball star, you know, because all blacks were excluded. But then before that in the 60s, even schools, there are schools that you couldn't go to as a black person. But despite all the resistance and all the setback, keep moving, black people keep moving, they keep moving forward, they keep moving forward. Now the crown was when Obama got into the White House and now America is actually changing. America has changed so much because when you have a child with a white person, the kids are, bla are called black. Now they blocked us, this is what's happening. This is what would have taken us to DC. This is the 14th Street Bridge. This would have taken us to DC. See how close it is. It isn't one car, it is a whole army of cars that's blocking. On the left is that tall monument. That is the Washington Monument. Uh, it's actually the tallest uh, structure in, in Washington, DC. This is the Potomac River. We are on Virginia side. The other side is uh, Washington, DC. And you see the monument. Potomac River is actually historically is what divides the north and the south. Historic America, if you cross this river from the south and you are black, you are free. Because the south allowed slavery. And slavery was practiced Virginia going south. Maryland going north, they didn't have slavery. This was the Freedom River. A lot of people died trying to cross it. So maybe this side uh, we are able to get into DC, but as when we get closer to the inauguration area, yeah, there's a lot of uh, military presence and uh, it is not a good sight. Uh... Just to imagine, this is actually 3rd and D Street. Next to it is actually Pennsylvania Avenue and then Constitution Avenue and then the mall where the inauguration would be but everything is just closed down. Yeah, I can yeah. see barriers all over. There are barriers, military, you can't even get to the mall, which is the 
the biggest open uh, area in any city. So in the past, what would we be seeing in this street? Oh, it, the place would be full of like, it'd be like a market day. It would be like people coming from a stadium. Mm -hmm. It'd be every, you couldn't find parking, but now even public parking is closed to the public. Yeah. Nothing is happening. Yeah. And you, at inauguration time, it's normally booming business. People selling merchandise all over. Every, now we can't see any. All the restaurants are full. You can't even get a room. If you can, a lot of people come from out of town. Schools bring their kids. Uh, states bring their representative. This place is so full. That's the full inauguration. Is the fullest time that this town ever gets. The restaurants are empty now. Every, they're closed. It's not just empty. They're closed. You can't even get inside. Right here is the Black Lives Matter Plaza. This started in, uh, in the summer of last year, 2020, when there were worldwide protests because of George Floyd's death. The Black Lives Matter movement rather settled on this location because it's right next to the White House. And, and Trump and the conservatives did not want this. But the mayor of D.C. said this is what's going to be. As you can tell, that is a B, this is a L, this is A, that's a C, a K. It's painted all the way until you get to the White House. And there's a very festive mood here today. You can tell that with the music in the background. That's the White House. You see the big U.S. flag in the background. That's the White House. And ordinarily, you'd walk a lot closer to the White House, to the fence that is, you see inside is now plastered with a lot of protest notes. This other fence that you see right in front of us, Alex, this one, just came came yesterday or the day before. It's because now they're sealing the entire place because of of what happened on the 26th. So wow. you can't get you, this. This is the closest you, can't you can get. get. Past here. You can't get past here. Yeah. This is affecting everybody because there's a lot of Kenyans that work in this town that do business in this town, and they've, they've had to shut down. In fact. Uh, there's Ethiopians, there's people from all over the world that uh, do hawking business right here in Washington, D.C. Biden has a very difficult task, but I know he's up to the challenge. Uh, and with Kamala Harris, there's no doubt in my mind because he's such a unifier. He wants to bring people together. And people want to come together because the div divisions have been a little bit too much on all of us. So we want to get together. I think they had the climax of protest on the 6th. After that, they should get it out of their system and join everybody in building this nation. A very interesting story there by Ken Agua, and that's America for you. Time now for my magical Kenya, and this is what I experienced at the Desert Museum in Marisabit before I flew to the U.S. The Desert Museum is located in Kenya's largest county by mass, Marsabit, in a place known as Loyangalani, and borders Lake Trukana, the largest desert lake in the world. The museum sits on a hill with a backdrop of a picturesque view of the lake. It is managed by the National Museums of Kenya. Wow, look at the museum's architecture quite magical, with the blue lake and the blue sky complementing the magic. This is uh, the only desert museum that you'll find in Kenya, and uh, here you will find artifacts of the different communities, the 14 diverse communities that are found in Marsabit. The beauty of Marsabit is not just about the diversity of culture, it has also diversity in terms of land mass, you know, the, you know, the landscape, uh, the different attractions that are found in different parts of the county. Indeed, the museum is a reflection of the diverse culture and attractions of Marsabit County. The museum was officially opened by Kenya's Deputy President, Dr. William Samoe Ruto. 
I got an opportunity to sample the artifacts here, a collection of amazing items. From weapons to jewelry, ornaments to traditional clothing, entertainment artifacts to cooking and food preservation items, all forming a rich heritage of the eight communities living around the lake. Ndiyo kijiko ya kutumia ukikula. Ndiyo kukula. Ehe. Na hii natoka kwa? Mdomo ya nine patch. Nine patch. Ya mdomo ya nine patch. Ndiyo. Ile samaki. Ndiyo ile samaki. Wow. Leangalani has managed to integrate Rindile, Samburu, and Turkana, and the Molo tribes in the same place. And we live together, and each tribe has its own unique cultures. So when you come here, you'll get a variety of cultures uh, to witness. This village, neighboring the desert museum, is inhabited by the El Molo. El Molo is the smallest tribe in Kenya, and it's only located here in the eastern shores of Lake Tukana. They have a unique way of living. They survive mainly by fishing. This is usually a very good place for people to come see them. The Desert Museum and other tourist attractions here are a big boost to the hospitality sector with fish from the lake, a key delicacy. Luyangalani is known for its fish, which they get from Lake Trukana. And uh, Lake Trukana fish is special in terms of size and in terms of quality. And the taste is different, it's very sweet. The taste you will identify it once you test Luyangalani fish from Luyangalani. I don't think you'll have met tests like that from any other fish from other lakes. Great, and locals here will tell you a trip to Marsabit would be incomplete without a visit to the desert museum and a feel of the local culture. That brings us to the end of our show today. Remember, our guest was Ken Agua, a Kenyan who has lived in the U.S. for over 40 years. Through his eyes, we were able to understand why the inauguration of Joe Biden as the 46th president of the U.S. was different from past inaugurations, and he's also shared his 40-year journey abroad. Many thanks for watching, and until we meet again next time, same time, same channel, my name is Alex Chamada and bye-bye from Washington, D.C.